So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, and so uh, this is the second uh, breakout room session. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I'm the director of uh, Learning Up System and School of Dentistry. And this session is really integration of the data and sharing big data. Uh, and, but it's enough about myself. One thing that uh, it's we, after my uh, um, presentation, we're gonna have a couple of minutes for questions and answer, a very short one. And then it's a great honor too, to have Dr. Muhammad Walaji, who is the leader in the Big Mouth um, an initiative with, uh, it's a great pleasure to have him here. So uh, he is not only a great researcher, uh, but also uh, he is advocating for uh, the data sharing uh, for uh, improvement in the medical dental field. I, uh, he's associate dean technology service informatics professor school of dentistry and uh, at the UT Health Science Center at Houston. So he's gonna speak right after me and uh, we're gonna right after he start the, after the questions and answer. And then we're gonna have a final audience questions and answer, especially him first and then the two of us uh, depend on the questions and time. So uh, thank you very much, Mohammed and Walajay to be with us. So let me share the screen. So, and one thing about Learning Help System, and you heard the keynote speaker, uh, um, Dr. Tabak explaining, it's, it's a diversity of data that now uh, we are dealing with. Before, it was something very specific to the dentistry, uh, to dental field, and now we have the medical field, we also have a research, and also the type of data that we deal with. And the data is would be uh, it's not only the clinical side, but also uh, the research side. We're talking about genetics, pharmacogenomics, neuroimaging. For example, we are using uh, uh, sensors for the brain to for the patient during the uh, uh, during dental pain, uh, during emergency, and also even how students are learning with each other. Uh, synchronizing their brains. And so, so all this kind of data, it's actually adding to our knowledge and how to apply that into the system, it's something very important. And so again, one slide that uh, it's very important for us to understand is that our knowledge before was always in the health field, very unilat unilat unilateral, was one perspective, one speciality, looking at the problem. A learning health system is a, a completely different aspect. It's more into a multidisciplinary, a combination perspective, looking at one problem, analyze the data, and then uh, combine, find solutions for that problem. So transform not only the practice, but also education and research. One thing important in the learning health system is really the ecosystem. And this is a learning cycle uh, that from Dr. Friedman is that, how do we do that? And we've example the dental school and we have the team of the learning health system team there. It's one, when we have the problem, is like how to for, form this learning community. It's not only the clinician and the leadership of the school but actually all the stakeholders, in, in this case, the patients, the faculty, the, in this case, clinicians and researchers, and also the leadership. But that is done by collecting the data that we have or project or set up for collecting uh, data that is important. Because we know that if you collect garbage, the outcome is garbage. So we need to think in advance to uh, get data that's important. And so this group that is very multidisciplinary uh, aligns with the leadership of the dental school and with strategic, strategic planning to define what are the problems that we need to help at the large level or a small level 
to optimize our care. So that becomes a data to knowledge where we use a data science and technology um, to really using methods, in this case, algorithms, for example, to uh, understand the problem and bring them into a performance. So for that, you also need a healthy structure in integration and uh, a practice-based implementation. Interesting to say that is not something that only technology-based, but also the behavior, because in all the stakeholders, and as we, uh, we learned also at the keynote uh, uh, presentation, that we needed to understand and be patient in our, even in our institution, how to better integrate this knowledge and how to put into application. It's not an easy task, but let me give you one example. For example, what are the characteristics of failing appointments? So the learning health system jumping in, uh, the team, and understand what's the age range of the patients that were known not showing up for the, the practice, where do they live, how they come to the practice, how they come to the university, uh, and so have them and how they were being notified so that we can improve the system and avoid that no-show of the patient. Or how we used teledentistry during the pandemic and uh, how what are the services that during that cycle of the pandemic were uh, better benefited uh, benefited by the teledentistry. Or as I mentioned before, uh, are the sensors, are the technology that can add for to our decisions. The same is with the optimization of the internal referral system. Few things, how to notify the patient, uh, the doctor that just refer the patient if the patient start the process or not. And also advocacy and also education. We have uh, the lectures that we work, we workshops for uh, the institution, for example, ADA. So it's a really large group. Uh, well, then that's another person for education and team that help in this process. So pain is one thing that is, I will use here as example. Why pain for learning health system? Um, is the main reason that you seek care. You can stay at your home and avoiding treatment or avoid going to the doctor, the dentist or the physician. But if you have a pain, you don't think more than twice. Just to give you an idea, 40 to 80% of chronic pain patients are misdiagnosed. And the main failure for that is because of comprehensive history for the patient. Another example is of a disorder that we are we misdiagnose and so common is migraine affects 12 to 16 percent of our population and even with that so common it takes more than five years for more than 50 percent of those patients to be diagnosed and you think as temporal and blood disorders that affect uh, several patients that come to our clinics uh, and many of them are also more complex. They have other comorbidities, not only TMD, but also fibromyalgia, back pain, which complicates, complicate the way that we diagnose and treat those patients. So when you go into the traditional model, so we have this breakdown in medical dental communication. Not only we don't have uh, access uh, in the traditional model from one side and the other, medical and dental, the way that you collect the data is very subjective. Is from zero to 10, zero is no pain, 10 is the worst pain, or oh, what's how your dental pain now, or seven, uh, what is your uh, back pain now, two. So it's very hard for us to very understand what you mean, the right or the left side. And that means that you have to figure out all this subjective information that is when you don't have enough time with the patient. And the other thing too is the poor medical dental communication and documentation. How can we summarize all that information, not, not only before the patient arrives at the clinic and after the appointment and how you remotely uh, observe uh, the, uh, the patient. 
So that's why the, the University of Dental School, uh, the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, for our clinical trials, uh, create for free. This is, is it's, uh, belongs to the University of Michigan. Uh, uh, the pain technology that can track the patients before that was uh, only in apps, in a mobile. At certain point, different versions, we had 15,000 patients using for free uh, that technology, 30% uh, outside the United States. What that data now in the University of Michigan transformed now, it's an API that can be dropped into an electronic health system, for example, Epic, for example, Axiom, and you can uh, uh, follow the patient uh, during the treatment inside the clinic and outside the clinic in this ecosystem. What you see that is an experience of the patient. So you have like a, a Google map of your pain and related symptoms. And then what you see in red is like cells. You have more than 2,300 cells that can bring the information of the intensity, area of the pain, dermatomes, quality of the pain, sleep, medication taking that you can use in the, any AI allowed uh, uh, technology to help patients. That invalidate methods can reduce uh, in publications uh, uh, that reducing 50% the need of the patients in the clinical trials. So, and it's not only male and, and but also 3D models in female different age groups. And that can be in the temporal uh, um, following up of the patients. So the, we can look at the data from yesterday, the data from two years ago, the data from the last appointment, and it's also allow also allows for aggregation of data. You can look at that data from 1,000 patients, 2,000 patients, and you can see the average by group male, female, by different age groups. And you can add also different symptoms. Let's say a patient with migraine and also with fibromyalgia. So uh, if you give a medication specific to migraine, would that medication only affect their head, their headache, or the pain in general? So you can zoom in a particular area completely, and you can get all the data specific to that region or the full body. And this is also reports that can be uh, uh, collected and uh, added to the data. You can decide by uh, you know subregion, dermatomes, and we can follow that in the time. And this is actually free for patients uh, to share. The data analysis there, that becomes uh, more complex in a way that we are adding compressed big data analysis from developed at the University of Michigan, for example, from uh, Dr. Uh, Ivo Dinov, where the data get into this diversity in model ranking. What are the features that, that decide what's the characterization of, uh, uh, in this case, uh, temporal angioplasty disorders and, uh, and migraine, data that we use and with random sampling can tell us how to characterize what are the factors and, clear, and symptoms that better uh, classify these patients. One thing very important that we are doing uh, with Dr. Eva Dinov, a collaborator for our group, is the obfuscation of data with the algorithm that uh, uses synthetic data, not only to expand the data but in, with uh, using the data that you provide, but obfuscating that. What do you mean? This synthetic data can decrease the risk of uh, re-identification of the patients in this data. So that protects the privacy of the patients. It doesn't matter how you share integrated. So you can define how much of, of obfuscation you use in the data. And that applies to other uh, data, not only pain. You can mirror imaging, you can do the clinical data. So what is the traction? We are at fully developed. In fact, uh, last week, uh, the pain track, uh, this technology was available for free for patients 
uh, this version uh, in uh, app, uh, Apple and also Android uh, is part of uh, several funding studies. It's validated by large uh, pharma trials. It's uh, working in digital health integration, FDA, and also partnering with us, the past program director of MIT Center for Biomedical Innovation. So we are applying uh, for large uh, uh, grants, for example, one that we just uh, submitted with the Learning Health Systems uh, Science Department at the medical school, uh, with uh, also the Midas, with Dr. Friedman and Dr. Dinov, looking at training, because we definitely needed that in Learning Health Systems and also AI, and how in a large, a uh, group of institutions, in this case, not only University of Michigan, Wayne State, uh, and also uh, Detroit Mercy School. So, and also our community-based collaborative care education, which are 16 active sites across Michigan. One thing important of that, we are developing even more models, 3D models of uh, an, uh, an, uh, the health collection, including for diversity engaging and uh, uh, in the collecting uh, uh, data from patients that in diversity communities. Another thing is we, we, we mentioned, it's also the use of sensors. So we are using brain imaging, for example, which can be also wearables, that it, this is a, a, just a different example, using Clarai. It's clinical augmented reality and artificial intelligence so that we collect the data so in real time, what you see there is data in real time from the brain of the patient. And so in this case, uh, we are we're using augmented reality. But this is when you get data from several patients, we create algorithms with AI. And what you see in the right is the algorithm telling us in a set of patients with dental pain, when the patient has pain and where the pain is. So when you see in the mark in red on the right, so you can see that how that correlated with a biomark in the brain, in this case, activation in somatosensorial cortex and frontal cortex. And just, uh... So conclusion. So in the, in the way that the learning health system work in this ecosystem of dental school first, is to improve the medical dental health assessment documentation and also reimbursement so that the system becomes not only uh, optimized, but also sustainable. The other thing too is support, so the clinical decision support so that to reduce the misdiagnose and detect early on side of conditions or the best treatment for the patient. And third, this ability to get data that is extremely diverse and generate this medical dental uh, uh, platform uh, that can tell us uh, the best treatment for the patients. Uh, this is supported by the, uh, a lot of uh, this research with the Office of Vice President of Research Initiative at the University of Michigan. We do have a new uh, 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 phase coming along and with coming along for the bold challenges and initiatives and grants. With that, I'd like to thank everyone and uh, open for questions, a brief moment. And uh, and at that, I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you very much, everyone. Let me see if you have any questions. So you, you add it to the chat. Any questions? So, okay, so with that, we're gonna move it to Dr. Mohamed Walajik that we already introduced at the very beginning. Thank you very much, Dr. Walajik. Great, thank you very much, Dr. De Silva. Can you hear me okay? You can see the right yeah. set of slides, right? Great. Well, th thank you, Dr. De Silva. It's really a pleasure uh, to be here and thanks very much for the invitation. So over the next few minutes, I just want to tell you a little bit about Big Mouth, um, which is a dental data repository that we've been working on uh, for over a decade. 
Um, we didn't know it then, um, but I think it's turning into a learning health care platform. So I want to just give you a little bit of the, the history of that and uh, tell you about some of the lessons that we've learned, especially when it comes to the data sharing components and you know, where we are going uh, with the tool in the future. So Big Mouth is a multi-institutional centralized data repository. So obviously multi-institutional, different dental, academic dental institutions currently contribute their electronic health record data to a central location, um, which is currently at UT Health. Um, it was established back in 2012 uh, with four institutions um, where we had about a million patients. We've grown it to um, just over four and a half million patients uh, right now. Um, data is refreshed every quarter. Um, and then one of the main things that we did when we started Big Mouth was we wanted to have a platform that users can quickly be able to query um, the data. Um, so that's been an important part. And, you know, um, we've found that academic institutions, especially those who contribute, have started to, to use the repository for many type of uh, projects. And I'll go over some of that uh, with you as well. So we were really inspired recently by this slide by Dr. Friedman. Um, and, and like I said, although we didn't start thinking about a learning health platform when we first created um, Big Mouth, I think now being cognizant of this area um, and how important data and informatics is for a learning health system, especially if we think about a multi-institutional learning health system, um, we are really trying to make sure that we gather the, the data in a way that you know, is computable. Um, we are able to share that using various standards and then hopefully in the future, um, the data can then be used for various types of improvement projects. So I highly recommend this article if you haven't uh, read it recently. So again, the primary purpose of Big Mouth is to serve as a really high quality resource, a resource for conducting you know, dental research. Um, and so what we've found is, is that Big Mouth has been used to uh, for many grant applications to inform the feasibility of various research studies. Um, it's being increasingly used um, for various types of population health, quality improvement, patient safety, and even observational studies. Um, it does support many QI efforts, um, and it can be used for things like um, determining if you have the, the right characteristics or a sufficient patient pool if you're doing some sort of prospective uh, research as well. So this is, just gives you a spread of Big Mouth. Now, we were very fortunate um, uh, 12 or so years ago um, in collaboration uh, with my colleagues, um, Elspeth Calendarian, who was then at Harvard, um, Joel White um, at UCSF, Paul Stark, who was then at Tufts, and myself at UT Health, um, where we proposed, that, proposed this initiative of a data repository with these four institutions, we were able to get some National Library of Medicine funding, um, and that's where we were able to combine the data and, and show proof of concept, you know, that this is something feasible to do in dentistry from electronic health records. We work within this consortium called CORI, uh, which is a group of dental schools that are very motivated to do more than just use the EHR for patient care, but potentially to use it in an improved way and to share data and resources as well. Um, and so since that time, we've on onboarded you know, several more schools, including University of Pittsburgh, Michigan, um, University of Colorado, Loma Linda, Buffalo, Iowa, um, and then University of Minnesota as well. And you can see from here, with the 4 million patients, um, we have a pretty good spread of patients you know, across the country. We're obviously you know, looking and love to have more institutions participate as well. These institutions at that time when they joined all used the Axiom EHR, um, but we are currently working with sites either who are adopting new EHRs to onboard that data into Big Mouth, but also for new sites who may be using another EHR to also participate. You know, these are all academic institutions. We're also very, very hopeful that um, other large um, or medium-sized clinical practices um, will also start contributing to Big Mouth in the future and give us a different lens in terms of the patient pool um, that we have currently. So as I mentioned, it was really important for us for Big Mouth to have a querying tool that users could actually access. Um, 
And so I, I won't do a live demo, but I'll just show you a few slides. Like, and here on the bottom right, you can actually see the interface. We use an open source platform called I2B2 that provides what they call this web workbench. And it's relatively simple. Um, first challenge we had to face was how do we authenticate users securely into this platform? And we we're able to use a um, platform developed by um, called In Commons by Internet2 that allows kind of single sign-on. So we're able to use the same credentialing system that you that every institution uses. So UT Health, I can just log in with my UT Health user ID. If I'm at University of Michigan, I can log in with you know whatever the the Shibboleth platform with a single sign-on is at Michigan. Um, and then when you log in, you kind of see a querying interface on the left-hand side. You see um, two folders, or currently we call it Axiom and Cori. The first folder being your single, your own EHR data, and then the Cori being the data from all of the institutions. And the idea is, is that if you're at UT Health, you know, you can see we've got over 450,000 patients. Um, you'd only be able to see your own data. You wouldn't be able to query anybody else's data. Then I can just simply drag and drop concepts from the left put them in the right and get some summary level information. So for instance, you know, if I'm interested in finding patients who have self report of diabetes and have had some sort of procedure codes completed, scanning and root planing, I'm able to quickly drag and drop, hit run, and you know, I'll get a sense of the patients. I'm also able to look at patient demographics, um, et cetera. The large part of the work from Big Mouth has been how do we extract the data from the source EHR? How do we model that data um, in a way that's queryable and understandable to the end user as well? And then importantly, this is a multi-institutional database. It's one thing to query your own data, but to query data across the institutions when we try and put it all together um, becomes a large challenge um, as well, which I'll allude to. I just wanna give you some examples of different research projects that researchers across the Big Mouth Network have conducted, you know, the projects related to prescribing of opioids and antibiotics, you know, correlation studies between you know, various medical conditions and oral health conditions. We get lots of research, research um, requests wanting to use the rich periodontal data that, that we collect, um, et cetera. Um, here are some more. Um, and I'll just point out, you know, the last one, you know, in addition to publications, we're very proud when um, Mana Tiwari, who is the, in, the main investigator on Big Mouth from University of Colorado, who recently received a RO3 NIDCR grant, you know, where she's looking at Big Mouth data and assessing the completeness and accuracy um, of the data set. So we're hoping to see, you know, many more grant applications being funded uh, with this data set in the future as well. So I want to talk about some of the main issues when it comes to Big Mouth. Um, one of the first things um, that we work really hard on, and you know, we've heard throughout the morning with the keynote, um, it's technology is one thing, but obviously people um, and behavior of those people is another thing. So one of the things um, that, that we really needed to set out was data governance. And these are the kind of the policies and the procedures that go around data sharing. So we're sharing patient data here. So, you know, we have to take that very seriously. Um, each of the institutions are now providing that data to a centralized repository that will then be used by researchers for projects that may be done outside of that institution, right? So, you know, um, our team has been really pleasantly um, surprised by the willingness of these dental institutions to share their data for the common good. Um, and so in order for us to protect that, what we have are, um, a limited data set, um, which means that all identifiers of patients have been removed with the exception of dates, like for instance, visit date. Um, and then we also are able to capture zip codes, five digit zip code. Because all of those other identifiers have been removed, the bar that we need um, in terms of um, agreements is a little bit lower. And so what we are required to do is, is execute a data use agreement between UT Health, which is the data steward and the contributing institution. Um, and that makes sure that the contributing institution is protected and UT Health is responsible for safeguarding um, that data. So that was one of the, the things that we, we outlined early on. When we first started Big Mouth, we talked a lot about who should get access to the data. Um, so obviously, um, when, we, when we first started, data from um, the 
researchers and students and residents and faculty who are at the institution who contribute had the ability to access data. But we were getting more and more requests from you know, others who weren't contributing. And so over the last few years, we've opened up that access to other researchers uh, from nonprofit institutions where they can now um, make requests for that access. It's really important that UT Health or Big Mouth does not own the data. The data the ownership still is as before. We are just data stewards um, and each site retains control of their data. So if they ever wanted to pull out, you know, they have that ability as well. Um, and then we have two types of access to the data. So if you are an individual who wants to look at the data, you can log in to that workbench that I showed you before. As soon as you get your credentials approved, you can log in and play around and get summary level information. But now let's say that you are interested in doing a specific research project using that data set. And you would like, you know, the big data dump um, for analysis. Um, you actually submit a proposal to a research committee um, that evaluates it, just like the IRB would evaluate um, your project um, or a grant review panel would um, um, review your project. And the idea is, is that um, each institution has a member representative um, and they are able to you know, provide feedback to try and improve the rigor of the research and to make sure that the data set is well attuned to answering that research question. Um, and then once that is approved, um, you know, the investigator gets higher brief approval, um, they then receive the data set and they can go ahead and do their um, analysis. So it's a relatively straightforward way of doing it. So data governance, like I mentioned, is one of the key, key components. Another aspect that was really surprising, you know, when we first um, did Big Mouth was the lack of standardization of dental data. So obviously procedure codes, CDT codes are really well standardized in dentistry. You know, we need those to get payment. But when it came to anything else, it was not standardized. And one significant area that was very problematic was, you know, why are procedures done? What is the underlying diagnosis of a patient? Um, and so thanks to my colleague, um, Elspeth Calendarian um, and others, um, a work group was formed and a diagnostic terminology was developed. Um, and many of the institutions that use Big Mouth now have adopted this terminology, uh, which was back then called Easy Codes. It then became um, Snow DDS. And then more recently, um, it's been harmonized with the American Dental Association, Snow Dent, um, which um, is also now a part of a very important um, ontology in medicine called SNOMED. Um, and many interoperable health record platforms use SNOMED as a way of making sure that, you know, we can, un different systems can understand the data that's coming through it. Um, so this has been a, a, a big achievement and has really helped many research projects. Um, but again, we, we still have many challenges when it comes to big mouth and, for instance, just something as simple as capturing medical and dental histories um, are often not standardized despite the effort of you know, the consortium uh, quarry. Um, so even the individual questions, you know, we have to do some manual mapping and we have our own big mouth common data model that we map everything to, um, so which poses some challenges. One, one good thing um, through technology has been medication. So obviously, you know, the opioid and antibiotic types of studies that are being done through Big Mouth have benefited through e-prescribing because now many of the institutions now use e-prescribing, they're forced or in the background, a standardized common terminology called Rx norm is being used. So that's helped us a little bit uh, from that perspective. So this is definitely an issue that, you know, we need to pay attention to when we are standardizing data sets. The other bit, really important thing, and often, you know, you'll hear uh, many people say you can't use EHR data for real research, right? Because real research needs um, high quality data. So you know, obviously, um, I think there is some truth in that, but, you know, I would argue that um, a lot of real research is being conducted using secondary data set. But with that being said, we do have to assess the quality of the data. And data quality is not um, so a very definitive thing. It's very much dependent on the use case that you are using the data for. So you have to be cognizant of what you are using that for, and then you can determine um, the, the quality of the data. So these are three ways that we think of data quality. You know, how complete is the data set? So for instance, I'll point you to diagnoses here on the table on the right. 
know, even though we have demographic information on four and a half million patients, um, we have diagnosis information, structured diagnosis information on about half a million patients. So obviously the data set is missing diagnoses on many, many patients. And that's, you know, for various local reasons, some institutions that contribute to Big Bath do not collect a structured diagnosis with every procedure. Other institutions, you know, mandate that. Every diagnosis, every procedure needs an associated diagnosis with it. The next issue is in terms of accuracy, right? And this is really, really hard to determine the accuracy of the data. Now, um, you know, I often argue that, you know, this data is being used for clinical care purposes all the time. So it cannot be that inaccurate if we are using it for patient records. But I understand that there are going to be deficiencies when it comes to accuracy. So there are various techniques we can use, such as making sure, you know, implausible values and things like that are flagged. But oftentimes we find accuracy when we do a research project with a researcher and a researcher digs into a research questions and finds out that, you know, this data does not look right. We then use this kind of virtuous cycle to go back to the source EHR to try and figure out what's happening. And we can then make quality improvements from the data capture perspective as well. And then lastly is this issue of consistency of the data. You know, we, it's, it's really good, if, like the dental diagnosis terminology, it's really good if we can do things in a common, consistent way. Terminology is just one example. Um, making workflows a little bit more consistent would also help in terms of um, the rigor of the data that's being collected. Okay, so um, lastly, I just want to talk a little bit about some of the things that we're projecting in the future. Um, Dr. Tabak kind of showed this information to you regarding um, big mouth. So obviously, you know, we have dental data in here, um, but we would love to get more and more of the corresponding medical data. So one of our institutions, we've been able to capture all of the data from the patient's medical chart, even though it's in a different EHR system. So you don't have to be on the same system. It obviously, it will make it easier. But, you know, there are techniques of matching the patient, grabbing the data and making it available. Um, we get lots of requests on imaging data. So we are working on projects, especially with all the machine learning type of projects of so trying to get um, radiographs into Big Mouth. Um, we want to expand the number of contributing institutions. So if you're listening and you don't contribute, you know, we would love to talk to you about, you know, um, having you join Big Mouth and, and joining, you know, this, this platform for learning. Um, and then lastly, we want to make it even easier than the drag and drop interface of querying. We actually want to go, go ahead into the data analytics field. So we're working on various types of data visualizations and dashboards, especially for some of our research projects when it comes to quality improvement um, as well. So that is it. I just want to um, end by just acknowledging lots and lots of people. You know, first of all, you know, we're, we're fortunate to get funding from the National Library of Medicine through another project that we have on quality measurement we've been able to use the big mouth platform as part of that and then you'll see all the people on the left hand side and all the institutions on the right hand side that have been really integral to um, making big mouth happen so with that um, i'm happy to have questions either for my talk or for uh, dr de Silva's talk well, thank you very much, Dr. Walidri. Uh, this is uh, an excellent lecture and the congratulations for your amazing work for all these years uh, helping our community in data science too. So I have a rather question here from Crystal <clears throat> Shuram. Have you tried working with a health information exchange to try to get some of this medical data versus going directly to the EHR? Yeah, no, it's, it's a really good question. Um, and no, um, to be honest, we have not worked with a health information exchange. And if you have expertise in the area, you know, I'd love to be able to talk to you. One of the questions I would think about is, you know, how would we, for instance, match up data from dental institutions um, with information in the exchange? Um, so I know perhaps there are some states where dental practices are part of the health information exchange. And hopefully um, that's gonna become more prominent. In Big Mouth, obviously we have these academic dental institutions. I know our UT Health Dental School, for instance, is not part of a HIE. So if we wanted to ga gather that patient's medical data, it'll be interesting to see how we would be able to match that up. Um, but yeah, I think that's yeah. a good idea that's worth exploring. 
So, so I work for uh, MyHen, Michigan Health Information Network, so Health Information Exchange. So as I'm listening to you talk about the data repository that you've already built, it just seems like it would make so much sense to be able to link a connection to a health information exchange. Um, but yeah, I, um, that's something I don't know. I, I think that's I think that's coming in the future at some point versus everyone, because you don't want to redo what we've done on the medical side, right? Everyone work in silos and now we're trying to 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 join it all. So yeah, thank you. Yeah. I appreciate it. Uh, uh, please, when you ask the question to uh, uh, identify yourself so that we uh, we also can see who is asking the question. But oh, I think that's sorry. <laughs> no, a really important question. So uh, let me see. Uh, from Sepida Banava from UCSF, thank you for your presentation, Dr. Aligi. Are there any plans to optimize big mouth dental condition categories and to support more query terms aligned with is no dent? Yeah, so, yeah, good question. So absolutely, we can we can definitely kind of put that on our, our radar. We want to make um, big mouth accessible and queryable. So if there are concepts that are missing in big mouth and they are contained in the EHRs um, that contribute, you know, those can then be pulled in um, into big mouth. And if you're talking about diagnoses specifically, which I think you were on snow dent, um, which um, has many diagnoses. So the snow DDS platform that many of the institutions use is part of snow dent. So it's a subset of the largest snow dent ontology. So, you know, depending on what query terms you are interested in, it may it may actually already be there. So I have a question here from uh, uh, Dr. Bruce Donoff, who was the previous dean at the Harvard University Day School of Dentistry. Uh, and so uh, what about the politics of using snow dent? So luckily, I think the politics of using snow dent have gone away um, <laughs> in terms of where they used to be. So, um, um, you know, our team and, and Elsbeth, especially, you know, we're very much aligned and have actually harmonized the snow DDS. And that's where the SNO comes from. It used to be called DDS. But when we talk with the snow dent folks, we all came together and we said, these are the most common concepts we're finding being used in an EHR. Let's create this smaller subset so there aren't, you know, tens of thousands of concepts we can put in. Um, but, and they are now part of snow dent. And so every year, snow dent is now being maintained, and our team members are kind of part of that process to make sure the new concepts are, are being uh, plugged in. So I don't think there are politics really um, anymore that at least I'm aware of, at least to that issue. I'm sure that there are other politics um, issues that should be addressed. Yeah. So, Dr. Alija, I uh, have several questions here. I also yeah. speak with members of my team in Learning Health System, like the uh, Waldo Higgins. I have a question for you. So uh, when we, even in the, our own system at the dental school, uh, across the departments, one problem that we have is consistency uh, because some of the uh, departments or clinical service treats mm -hmm. the axiom, for example, or in a different way, how to uh, respond to those tools that we have. So give us an example in your own institution, how you try to uh, uh, standardize and have more consistency across you know, departments for the data. And you can even expand that for other institutions that are collaborating with you. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So it's, it's a really important um, question. Um, and I, I don't have a great answer for it, but I can tell you, for instance, how it's worked at two levels. One is you know, the level of the consortium, but one is you know, here locally. So locally, what we have is we have a very rigorous change request process. And I don't know if you have that at other sites. So any request that's being made to change in the EHR goes through a committee. Um, of, and there had, we have some representation from different areas. Um, and in that committee, we are pretty cognizant of what would happen if we make this change? What is the impact to the enterprise um, as a whole? Um, and then... By having those discussions, so if a perio department wants this and a pros department wants this, the idea would be to get those departments together and try and collaborate if it impacts 
um, each other. So that process, I think, has worked relatively well. Um, I think we also, you know, when we implement EHRs, those of you who are going to a new EHR, this time is really right right now, right? To really rethink how you enter capture data, how you do your workflows um, with all of this um, in mind. So really understand the clinical side, your IT people, your clinical IT people need to be you know, combined with the clinical people um, so that you can design a system that works. At the consortium level, we've had various standardized projects. So this, the DDS, Dental Diagnostic System, is an excellent example, right? This was a group of people that came together and said, these are the types of diagnosis that we wanna be able to collect. Everybody said, we will use these and we're not going to change them, right? We're going to commit to not changing them and making local customizations um, for our own needs. We will do that through a annual rigorous review process um, as well. So I think those are the techniques, you know, at least I can uh, think of for that. Okay. Um, any additional questions for the team, for the um, audience? Yeah. So what are the next technology and driven steps in big data when we are integrating dental and medical data? One thing is to use the electronic health system that can be Axiom, can be Epic, but what is the main, the future in the technology? Because in several institutions, we are developing new tools that you know ask specific questions or they are improving. And sometimes Axum or even uh, Epic or others are kind of um, uh, protecting the system, making uh, difficult for uh, some customization of the in the big enterprise. So what's the next step, as you see, uh, in, uh, in a working with the different data sets in, in different electronic health systems? Yeah, so, so I think in, in dentistry, um, you know, we can, we can learn from many of the things that have already happened in medicine. So I think, you know, um, as a slide I showed at the beginning, I think having data in a way um, that is structured, organized, having metadata, um, and making the data computable and even making the knowledge computable so that we can do things like you mentioned, Dr. Silva, clinical decision support is going to become really, really important. Um, so, and I see that there is a lot, a lot of work for us uh, to do in that, in that side. Um, so I think it's really making sure that machines can better understand the data. You know, so obviously in Big Mouth, you know, I talked only about structured data. So much data is there in the clinical notes, right? So rich that we're not even getting. So we're beginning to um, use various AI, machine learning, NLP type of techniques to extract some of the data and make it available to researchers, but also to a machine who can then hopefully help that researcher or a clinician at the point of care uh, to make better, better decisions. But it's all going to be about you know, how, how good is that data structure? Yeah. Yes, we now thank you very much, Dr. Archie. Uh, and it's I uh, I just uh, have immense gratitude for uh, your presence, uh, your uh, uh, and the audience here. That amazing questions here, uh, and and also for the organization of this event. We definitely need more information in this field. Uh, it's expanding really fast. And uh, in a point that we needed to really work together and use our own innovations, using our own uh, needs in the, especially now integrate medical and dental field uh, to uh, improve uh, our care, our education, our education, also re our research. So with that, thank you very much you all. You're gonna all have a link for the videos uh, of this presentation. And I hope to see you on all the next event on for uh, this integrative collaborative event, Medical and Dental for University of Michigan. Thank you very much, you all. Have a wonderful day.